<sighs> Finally, it's done. After roughly three hours and 18 minutes of my life spent on clicking, my hard work has paid off. I should go tell my friend about it. He is gonna be so flabbergasted when he sees my exciting new invention. Hey dude, what? Look at this thing. I built it all myself, consisting of discrete measurements and all waned regard for physics. You used the same material for everything. Did you turn on your auto clicker on accident? No, it's genius. It'll make things appear on command. It's like I'm a mad scientist. I can control where things spawn. Ah! As you were saying? Drat! Game of pity, I must have been wrong. I'm never wrong. So this thing has absolutely no record of existing on the wiki, meaning we can't figure out what it is. Did they add it to the latest update or something and no one noticed? They would have added it by now. It has been a little while since the release of the newest version. I must have the strangest experiences with the game then. Oh, by the way, did you forget to change your ports before opening up the server? So, I want to open ourselves up to some trivia. We are going to be given three scenarios, and we will have some answer to them. I think we should be ready now, so here we go! Where do you get your cooked steak from when you don't have a designated place to go? The map. Just kidding, it's a cow. Don't have any friends but don't want to get out into the real world to give it a shot? That's no problem at all, because Minecraft has the solution for you. We have wolves and stuff. You're building something and you hear an arrow launching. Before you know it, it is lodged in your ear. Ouch, that sucks. You turn around to see where it came from, and hey, what a pleasant surprise. It's a skeleton, it seems angry, and it's trying to kill you. Now, we should take a closer look at the nonsense I was talking about just now. Think about this. What do all of these three things have in common with each other? Well, the sources of which the incidents occurred are all related to mobs. Where did these mysterious video game concepts stem from? And more importantly, where does that lead us? Correct. Spawning in Minecraft. We all do it, even in real life, I think. Did we spawn very slowly before we were born? Where did the cell come from? Crap, I think I might have merged two quizzes together. Never mind that. Spawning is one of the crucial components of Minecraft that gives it that little extra bit of fun. About as much as so as the aspect of building, destroying, using, and 3D rendering, as well as other fun things that end in ing. Minecraft spawning has been fleshed out over the over 12 years it has been developed alongside the rest of the game, and since then, a lot of background knowledge was needed in order to understand the mechanics of it in full. Where are we today, and how does spawning work now? But first off, the first elephant in the room. This video's idea is by no means original. It has been done before by other people over the years. Some of these videos even do a better job than myself at covering everything that the viewer should know about how the spawning mechanics work in the game. But here's the thing that I want to do differently. You see, most of the videos explaining spawning mechanics that already exist not only focus on how mob spawning works, but they usually are related to mob farms. Some of them are on the shorter side as well. And come on, I'm not that smart. So what I want to do is focus on the grand scheme of things and focus on both types of spawning that takes place within the game, the mobs and the player, split by section. I think you should also show your support for the other people that touch on the subject before me because I know they worked hard on their research. Because of how much the thing has changed over time, how exactly has it done that? What is the history of spawning? Before we get into that boring stuff, we need to get the other boring stuff out of the way. Number two, what is a mob anyway? It's the same word used for an angry group of people that don't like something. What are these funny little things that spawning needs to depend on? A mob, short for mobile entity, is a type of entity having its own specialized MBT data. I made an explanation about how MBT worked in my storage video if you want to check that out for yourself. Summon the info card. Each mob can be interacted with in different ways as well as pretty much in the same way. Each of them can be brutally murdered the same way as everything else. It's Minecraft. These interaction abilities differ between the types of mobs. 
as they are meant to resemble how something would exist in real life. Or, alternatively, someone's imagination because who has seen a bunch of phantoms outside after pulling multiple all-nighters in a row? If so, go to bed. Along with their ability to be interacted with, each has their own programmed AI which may allow them to fly, walk, or jump. We have very nice mobs, like the fox, the sheep, or the very useless bat. But not every mob is a nice little fellow, it's not all sunshine and rainbows. These three mobs are what are called passive mobs. It's a category of mobs that are not supposed to directly attack the player in any way. On the opposite end, you have the hostiles, which as you might have guessed, try to kill you. But what if you wanted to balance it out a little, be more realistic, and only attack when you are being attacked? In the middle of the passive hostile spectrum are the neutrals. Other interactions or game instances may change their hostility the same way as attacking. Some other mobs are bosses, unused in regular gameplay, existed as a joke, don't exist yet, previously existed, or never existed. Some mobs are programmed not to drown in water as to keep their aquatic traits. Some burn up in the daylight, which honestly is very satisfying to watch. And others react very funny when I tried to read them the Bane of Arthropods. I think the book is too scary for them. These core differences are important to have because of the ways the game implements them for the way they spawn. Thirdly, a bit of a quicker point, but probably still important anyway. This video is going off of information from the fandom slash gamepedia article from spawning as well as some other resources that I plan to link in the video description. It is also important to know that this video is somewhat up to date as of the 1.18 update of the Java edition. It may still contain information about 1.17 and below. There could be some outdated information about this as of like right now, but most of it should be in line with modern versions of the game. On the contrary, as early as the very next snapshot, things could be changing in very major ways and we wouldn't have a clue about it until it had already happened. So if you are planning to make a mob farm with your newly found information, then it should be best to have this in mind so that you don't find out the hard way. Now, the burning million dollar question. What is spawning in the first place? Well, what we are referring to as spawning is actually a little ambiguous. There are different types of spawning in the grand scheme of things. The least ambiguous answer to this question is the mere act of putting things into existence that can move, breathe, and live. This would branch off to player spawning and mob spawning, which, in itself, leads to different types of mobs and their own differences between one another to strategically balance out their spawning. All of these are connected to the spawn cycle, which has some other things to it that make it even more realistic. And then, after that, they disappear because they are useless. In summary, the entire design has been intricately designed over the years. In the beginning, spawning was of course in a super, super primitive state. The first mob in the game was added in version RD 13.23.28. Yeah, we're going to go that far back today. This mob was the human, which borrowed a texture from one of Notch's previous games, Zombie Town. They can only be described as miserable lunatics in a harsh way of description. Their only purpose in life is to run, flap their arms around, and give themselves dizziness as they look all over the place without any sense of direction. That was pretty much their only mechanic. As for how they spawned in RD 13.23.28, it is about as primitive as it gets. When the game starts up, it automatically finds places in the world to create some instances of the human mob, and that's it. No more mobs. But what if you wanted more? I mean, as long as you don't fry your computer with the sheer amount of humanness, the sky's the limit, right? Say no more, because in version RD 16.00.52, you can now press the G button to materialize a human right in front of your eyes, all with one push of a button. Wow! Otherwise, everything else was pretty much the same. You just had a button that defied the laws of conservation of matter, and especially energy. On the player front, it really just relied on picking a random position on the map to appear in upon the game starting up, and then teleporting you there. This process can be done repeatedly by pressing and or holding down the R key. That is pretty much it, actually. 
The next change that would be made to the spawning system is around the survival test era. As more mobs were added to the game, there needed to be a way to implement them. In doing so, the human mob that had appeared before, while still being in the game files, was already being phased out in favor of, well, real mobs. It didn't take very long for the human mob to retire. Must have been very successful at his job. If you count brainless idiocy as a profession without the pay, I guess. Also, hints started to appear that suggested that mobs were beginning to spawn in multiples sometimes. A good indicator that the survival test wasn't messing around with mob testing. Even early on, it did a relatively good job at that. Oh, now it's 2010, and the phase of development went from pre-classic to pre-classic except without the pre, and then after a little bit more, to in-dev. And guess what? A breakthrough occurred with mob spawning. This is huge! Notice that in the survival test, mobs were spawning in broad daylight, which of course was not very natural in the sense of modern game standards. To aid the situation, we expand upon the lighting system and tie it to spawning events so that, put simply, if it is dark enough, a monster will spawn there. Done. Players are happy. Citation needed. In the in-dev plus F phase of Minecraft, the respawn functionality was added. This was added as a convenient way to retrieve your items and continue playing the game exactly where you left off, instead of having to reload from a save file every time you die. After the infdev phase, around Alpha 1.2, the mob spawning algorithm had a major reform. Wouldn't be the last time. The most notable of them is the way chunk checks work for mob spawning. Before the update, it started in the center of the world for mob spawning and went to the other chunks afterward. But after the update, it became more randomized. Around this time as well, the player spawning system was designed in a way where players would only spawn on sand blocks. Eventually, during the late beta phase of the game, it would be changed up in a way that allows them to spawn in certain biomes which would continue to be tweaked into the release versions as more and more biomes were added to the game. Later on in game development, around release version 1.9, Player spawning can now be controlled somewhat by having a radius in which the player can appear around the real spawn point. Release 1.15 and newer saw some more frequent changes to spawning in general, especially during 1.18. 1.18 was a good time for developers to experiment with things, and they did it. A lot. In Experimental Staff Shot 1, they made it so that the hostile mobs could only spawn in complete darkness. The third one made it depend on height as well, which was a detriment to many, many mob farms. So did that stick around? No. And that should bring us to today. The change to Minecraft in general, even in something as specific as spawning things in the world, it can be a bit overwhelming sometimes. This is why 1.12.2 is still my favorite Minecraft version, like literally ever, with 1.8.9 coming in second. So, enough of the past, where are we now? Let's find out. For the time being, let's shift our attention to player spawning, and then move on to mob spawning later on. The epicenter for all player spawning depends on the spawn point and its corresponding chunk, appropriately named the spawn chunk. There is a process in the game that determines where the spawn point is if the world is being generated within survival or creative mode. It goes a little something like this. The first step is to pick a random point within a 1001 block area ranging from negative 500 to positive 500 on both the X and the Z axes. The random part doesn't come up out of the blue from the spawning process itself. Instead, it is just another thing that is determined by the world seed. After the seed pinpoints where the spawn point should be, this is the part where the game then analyzes the point to see where it ends up. The burning question for the game is, is the person in the ocean. If it does end up in an ocean biome, then the process is considered a failure. Minecraft then tries again with finding a spawn point that isn't in the ocean. This time, it is within a 3001 block range, from X or Z, negative 1500 to positive 1500. If it happens to be in an ocean again, the game just kind of sets your spawn point to be in the ocean anyway. Sucks to be you, but you're in luck if you're near the shore, that is. This is because of the spawn radius game rule, which varies where the player may actually be spawned in the world. 
within a 21 by 21 block area by default, which technically doesn't make it a circular spawning area, but uh, we'll go with it. In Snapshot 21W42A, Mojang supposedly tried to fix this issue by basing the spawn locations more on climate parameters for the biome instead of any specific biomes directly. But who knows for sure? It could still be possible to spawn in the ocean for all we know. I am getting a little sidetracked here, so where was I? Oh yeah, radii. A game rule command may change or eliminate this radius. With this radius in place, whenever the player respawns, terms from the M dimension, or gets spawned into the area for the first time, concerning they didn't change it themselves, they will reappear somewhere inside of here. Another condition this has is to find the highest Y coordinate such that they will always, in theory, spawn on the surface. The game also tries to find a grass block to spawn on top of. But if there are no grass blocks to be found on the highest available Y coordinate for each block in the spawn, it just kinda finds a good block for the player to appear on, which could even be from below an overhang. If all else fails, no grass exists, sadness and death all around, the game just decides to have the player spawn directly at the spawn point. No questions asked. Gets the job done, I guess. In adventure mode, this range process is kind of ignored entirely, and just finds the spawn point without using any extended areas. But it will still make some attempts at finding a valid place to spawn, but let's just say we'll just be a little less, uh, reliable? Another thing of note is that whenever the player spawns, every time the time is right, the spawn point is always in the spawn chunk. The chunks around the main spawn chunk are also known as spawn chunks to an extent. These chunks function a little differently to every other chunk in the world. Visually, they are the same thing, but there are a few core differences to keep track of. Normally, when a player goes outside of the distance in which they need to be in for the chunk to be present in memory, the chunk will then unload. This is not the case for a spawn chunk, as no matter where the player is in the world, the chunk will always be present in memory, and some functions that would take place there may continue to operate, if they just so happen to rely only on chunk loading. This is useful for some automatic redstone-based farms if they are built near the spawn point. The player can be anywhere in the world, and they will still continue to process materials. So, if a redstone machine you built near enough to spawn causes the TPS to go down, nice job, because everywhere you go, you're going to experience it, even in single player. Although, this does not work with random ticking as that relies on player distance. If the player is far enough away from a random ticking event, the process will stop. Wherever the events will occur requires a little more attention. This is because it's not strictly an area of the world where data can still be processed. Instead, the spawn chunk serves as an influence to the chunks around it. Upon world creation, a ticket is applied to the spawn chunk with a value assigned to it. In this case, they call it a level. The spawn chunk is labeled as level 22. Each chunk around it is also given one of these tickets, and is given a number higher and higher than 22, depending on how far away it is from the spawn chunk. Eventually, the number will reach 34, which is the hard-coded maximum that the game can assign a chunk. These numbers are useful for telling the game whether or not they are active. For levels 22 to 31, it is treated as if the player was in the area to begin with. In other words, everything is active, well, except for natural mob spawning and random ticking, that is. Levels 32 to 34 is where things start to become a little... inactive. At level 32, ticks become even less of a focus, and entities will stop moving. Level 33 is the border between active and inactive. Barely anything is functional within this area, as redstone no longer works in this range. Outside this area are all chunks with level 34 tickets. Aside from generating new chunks, these chunks are considered completely inactive and will only function again when the player re-enters them. Back to the topic of the spawn point. One thing that most players are aware of is that the spawn point can be changed with the use of some useful items in the game. This leads up to the individual spawn point. This is different from the world spawn point, as an individual spawn point only affects the one person in the world. 
which is especially utilized in multiplayer such that every player that plays on the server can have a chance to set their own spawn points for themselves. The world spawn point is left unaffected. The ways that the individual spawn points can be created or changed is via the use of respawn anchors, beds, or the use of commands. These spawn points can be obstructed by removing the object solely responsible for creating said points. If the area around it becomes blocked off, then it will also be considered obstructed. Sounds straightforward enough, right? Don't get excited because I haven't even begun to talk about mob spawning yet. In order to understand how mobs spawn nowadays, it is important to get ourselves familiar with the spawn cycle, which is the backbone to most of the things going on here. This cycle also keeps track of time and uses that information to spawn different mobs. We should know that different mobs are tied to their own specialized interval for which they spawn. For example, any hostile or aquatic mob will spawn the most often, with chances of spawning appearing every single game tick, which is equivalent to 1 20th of a second in real life time. Now, why so much danger in the world where we can barely have much food in the wild? Easy, it's just that most hostility in the world around you during the daytime takes place underground, where the generally safer stuff will be on the surface. Most above-ground passive mobs fall under the spawn category of friendly mobs, which spawn every 400 ticks rather than every single tick, which is basically 20 seconds in real lifetime. For one single spawn chance, ugh. You better start walking around or AFKing then for food, huh? Okay, so we have different intervals where any mob has a chance of spawning. So that must mean we figured it all out? I don't think I have a positive answer for that, because I have doubts that people check the video length sometimes. Another side note is that animals do seem to appear very frequently when you venture off into new areas of the world. That is because for passive mobs, they can also be summoned the first time the chunk is generated, so you can have the first little explosion of food-related resources at your disposal. Otherwise, yeah, you are gonna have to wait a little bit to get your food. But, the animals aren't the rarest of these naturally spawning mob types, because that title would have to go to the Wandering Trader and their corresponding Llama type, because an attempt is made to spawn one of these every 24,000 game ticks, or 20 minutes. That is about as long as I have been talking right now. These spawning events can only happen when chunks are loaded, the area in which the spawning cycle can occur is an arrangement of chunks around the player, that being a 15 by 15 chunk square, with the player in the middle. This is true for all of the players in multiplayer, as to not force anyone to hunk 10 packs. Because, well, not all of us are like wolves in that sense. There is a catch to having this large spawn area. Practically, the stable spawn areas actually isn't that large, this is where we start talking about spheres. Spheres? I thought circles were illegal in Minecraft. Ah, here's where you're wrong. Not with mob spawning. It was in the mechanics the entire time. The game is now illegal because of the use of circles! Hmm, the spheres. How does the game use them here? There's a good chunk of mobs, more notably hostile mobs, among a few more, that are automatically removed from the game, or despawned if you want to be more casual about it, when they are outside a range of 128 blocks from the player in a spherical formation. There are a few more spheres that are used in the game, like at 48 blocks, a wandering trader is permitted to make a spawn attempt considering the conditions of the 20 minute interval are met, and there is an area above ground within that range that the attempt can be made. Outside the 32 block range, Mobs are programmed to stay stationary until either they are outside the 128 block range where they despawn immediately, or they are within the 32 block range when their AI resumes to whatever move functions it decides to commit. That's not all because some mobs decide to despawn randomly between both ranges because, yes. Outside the 24 block range, mobs are allowed to make their spawn attempts as to not spawn next to the player because, come on, that's a little unnatural. So, effectively, outside the range, there are areas where mobs spawn, aren't moving, and despawn all at the same time. You know, that is actually really neat when you think about it. 
the last sphere of interest is the 16 block radius. When a spawner is in that range, events are permitted to be processed from mob spawners. Basically, every so often, it will make an attempt to spawn something in a 9x3x9 area a few times. That's all. Sometimes, mobs are spawned singularly, although, this isn't the case all the time, because there is a random chance that the game will spawn multiple of these mobs at once, hence, pack spawning. There is another chance layer that the game takes into account, as some chunks are chosen through the random tick, which is a process of processing random events in the game, which is also useful for things like growing crops and leaf decay, among a slew of other cool stuff. For each chunk that is chosen to spawn packs of mobs, an expanded area is created that could span across many other chunks, a 41 by 41 square. Notice that I said square, because these spawning areas are only one block high as to make the entire pack spawn on the same Y level. And the middle of the 41 by 41 area is the center point, which is useful for chance radii. Essentially, the further you go from the center of the spawn area, the less likely a member of the pack will be spawned there. As long as the area is all within the same biome, almost all of the pack will spawn within 10 blocks of the center. While it is still possible, it is very, very rare to have a pack member spawn at the edge of the spawn area. Other conditions are also made for pack spawning. The same mob has to be spawned in the whole pack, meaning that you can only have, for example, all creepers or all sheep, but not half creepers and half sheep. Some mobs are spawned in packs more often than others, which depends on a weight value. The same concept is also applied for individual spawning, but that is for the Bedrock Edition only. Ah, gotta love platform inconsistencies. Another variable to consider is how many of each mob can spawn in these packs maximum. Every mob has their own pack cap. For most of them, their max is 4. Gas have a lonesome 1 because they are just destined to be sad about being alone, I presume. Most equids, basically all the horse-like animals, spawn in packs of up to 6. And at the top are fish and wolves, which can spawn in packs of a staggering 8. Wait, hold on. Oh wait, there's more? Okay, so we're actually going to need a bit more elaboration on that. You see, actually, a whole ton of mobs can actually have a minimum pack size as well. Which kind of branches off in terms to the combinations the game makes, which I won't even care to list here. Some spawn events are more important than others, which is especially true for pack spawning. The game usually processes events for structure-aligned packs before anything else. This also limits what packs can spawn where, as other types of mobs are far less likely to spawn within these structures than the mobs that were designed to be spawned in these locations in specific. That just about does it for the general stuff about the creation of mobs within the spawning area. But now, what if this was everything about the mechanics at all? Well, eventually, there would be so many mobs within the game where it would lag out your game and you are forced to painstakingly kill them all. Not good. What can we do about such a dire situation? Introducing the mob cap. Now with 100% more equations. The mob cap of a type of mob can vary in terms of how many chunks are loaded within a given area. Put simply, the more chunks you got, the more mobs you can naturally put in the game. Though, the mob cap is also taking the next chunk outside of the 15 by 15 area in every direction into account, effectively making the calculation based on a 17 by 17 figure. The mob cap is calculated by taking the constant set by each mob cap category and multiplying it times how many chunks are currently loaded and then dividing that result by 17 squared or 289. What are these constants that I have alluded to? Put it this way. Say you have all 289 chunks loaded, cancelling out two of the terms in the equations, leaving the constant that remains. The constant for each mob is dependent on its category. Perhaps the most famous one is the monster constant with 70. There is one more category that is reserved for miscellaneous items. This category has a constant of negative 1, which results in a negative number per every calculation which in Java basically means that the cap for the miscellaneous category is limitless. 
This is useful for entities that aren't mobs, like dropped items and arrows, for instance. This is also used for when mobs are not spawned via natural means, like if you were to slash summon them with the matching NBT properties, or spawn them from a spawn egg. Once the mob cap is reached, every cycle attempt that is set to be done afterward will be skipped, thus returning nothing, no new mobs. The way this can be done is checking each chunk to see how many mobs are in them, and then adding them all up to see if it reaches the maximum natural mob count. One can enforce the cap to be reached via player interaction, such as breeding and manual spawning. Of course, by doing this, one can easily exceed this limit, and as a result, natural spawning will be suppressed. How exactly does it decide whether or not to spawn something or modify its chances and properties? That leads us to our next point. Conditions. Spawn conditions are extra or changed properties to pack and or individual spawning that depend on the environment around it. Structures and even biomes may increase, decrease, or even zero out the chances of mob spawning. Like how guardians will always spawn in the presence of a guardian temple, and how a chicken never ever spawns in the nether, unless it's part of a chicken jockey. It may also depend on the variant of the mob as well, so you could theoretically only have villagers with a specific clothing, or have only the child variant of a specific mob. In regards to quantity, there can be one condition, there could be hundreds, there could be none extra from its base. It doesn't really matter all that much under one condition. No pun intended. In order for a spawn attempt to be successful, all of the conditions listed within the area have to be met. If one fails, then the entire spawn attempt fails. There are also some hard-coded conditions that have been added that more or less directly control whether or not they spawn, which one may be able to gather from previous points in the video thus far. The spawn event must take place at least 24 blocks away from the player, and 128 at most. The mob cap for that type of mob must not have been reached. Hostile mobs cannot spawn if the difficulty is set to peaceful, etc. One of the most famous ones of these is that mobs such as skeletons, zombies, and creepers, to name a few, depend a great amount on the area's light level. This has changed very recently as of the 1.18 update. Before this update, they relied on a formula that evaluated the chance of the spawn attempt turning out successful. Essentially, the light level on the block multiplied by 100, then divided by 8, or multiplied by an optimized 12.5, was the percent chance of the spawn attempt failing, though in reality, the game actually depended on the 0 to 1 chance, where 1 meant absolute certainty. So actually, the light level was divided by 8, and we called it a day. You see, x over 8 has to equal something less than 1 in order to have any chance at something spawning within the spawning area. If we plug in the light level for a completely lit up surface, 15, then we get 15 over 8, equivalent to 187.5% chance of spawn failure. Good luck with that one, bub. A limit was approached at light level 8, where 8 over 8 is met, only resulting in a 100% chance of spawn failure. Sure, nothing would still spawn, but coming from the 1 over 8 slope of the equation and the fact that this is completely linear, ensures that anything less than a light level of 8 was able to spawn these hostile mobs. Thus, that concluded the story of why the minimum light levels for spawning zombies and stuff was light level 7, just a nice little implementation of linear algebra. How did 1.18 change this? When the first experimental snapshot came out for the update, they made it so that mobs can only spawn at light level 0, which makes everything I said in the past 2 or so minutes useless. All this time we have been beating around the bush of despawning. Sure, we did mention it a little earlier, but I think it is time to give it some justice. As long as the chunk is currently loaded, the despawn process can happen. Most mobs are susceptible to being despawned, including hostile, neutral, and passive mobs, but not all of them. More notably, bosses are excluded from the list of despawning capable mobs. The only hostile mob that does not despawn that is also not a boss is the Shulker. A passive mob that cannot despawn is the villager, as to preserve their trades. That's an extra point for convenience, eh? Let's bring up the spheres around the player again. For review, outside 128 blocks, mobs despawn instantly, and under 32 blocks, they will never despawn, 
between 32 and 128 blocks away from the player is like the Russian Roulette area. The way mobs despawn relies entirely on chance, light level, and time. Light level and time are tied to each other loosely, because if the light level is considered low enough, it will take 10 seconds for mobs outside 32 blocks to get into the chance phase. For higher light levels, it is 30 seconds instead. The chance phase uses ticks and chance to determine which mobs despawn on that tick. Any mob under the previous criteria after their grace period, now every tick, there is a 1 in 800 chance that it will despawn, which is equivalent to 1 in 40 every second. The one thing that can save the rest of the mob set from being despawned boils down to one NBT option, the persistent tag. To be persistent is to continue to exist within the world or be exempt from any despawned attempts. Persistent mobs are also exempt from the natural mob counts, so even if there are 70 hostile mobs, if one of them is marked as persistent, another one can still spawn because the game acknowledges that there are 69 non-persistent hostile mobs within the loaded chunks. There are several ways a mob can be labeled as persistent. Mobs are persistent if they were generated as a vital part of a structure. Tamed animals are also capable of toggling the persistence tag. Fun fact, it is one of, if not the only ways to toggle it manually without the use of cheats. Another scenario can be mentioned for the Enderman, because when they are holding a block, they too cannot despawn, because that block has got to end up somewhere. A common trick that players use to reliably make a mob persistent is to apply a name tag on them. A cheaper method is to use something that mobs can ride, which are minecarts and boats. All in all, the way in which Minecraft mobs and players spawn brings a more quote-unquote realistic take in how things can, well, exist. At least in the sense of Minecraft physics. The most fascinating is that people's understanding of spawning in the game transformed mod farms over time. From what was once just dark rooms became some of the most impressive machines in the Minecraft space. And what, just to get a few extra items for arrows or villager trading or something? Now that you two are more knowledgeable about all of that, any questions? Ugh, I spent all that time rambling about spawning for nothing? Hmm. People these days, they are never destined to learn about things outside of school, which even then they are doing the bare minimum. <laughs> uh, so what was that about the port? What? Hmm. Well, I guess at least YouTube has a backlog of my ramble, but hopefully I was able to give some of you a bit more of an understanding about player and mob spawning, told by someone who should probably allocate some time to more important things in life. Like, uh, I don't know, school? Employment? Now, if you excuse me, I'm gonna anticipate the next big update to the game, and hopefully, nothing much gets too outdated too fast. I hope. Bye. <laughs>